All right, so I want to say, so what were some of the best movies, best books ever read, that you've ever read? Yell, yell them out. Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back. Best book you've ever read. That's the worst of the movies, by the way. Just The Shack. Band of Brothers. What? One more time. Ben-Hur of Judah. All right, what else? Who else? All right, I'm going to go there. I'm going to point at people because I can't. Mere Christianity. Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles. There you go. <laughs> Mel Brooks. All right. There you go. That's awesome. Green Mile. The Green Mile. The Green Mile. Okay. The Revenant. The Revenant. The Revenant. Okay. I said Dead Poets Society. Dead Poets Society. Goodwill Hunting. All right, what are some other just great, and I'm not talking guilty pleasure. I'm not like, I want to go home and cry for an hour, right? Or let's just blow things up. I'm going to talk about the, think about those movies, the books that moved you as a person. Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. You already went, you can't go Sacred again. Romance. Sacred Romance. <laughs> Mr. Holland's Opus. The Doctor. The doctor. I've never heard of it. But I've, never, I've not watched anything, so I'm going to be the worst on that. So in case you're wondering, I want to let you know what the greatest book ever written was. It's clearly The Fellowship of the Ring uh, by J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> just, just so in case you didn't know, right? And, and, and I'll just tell you why really quick. Right, movies are great because in great movies and great books, there is redemption. There is redemption. At the core of every great story is a narrative of redemption, of what's wrong being made right, and someone being willing to pay a price for that to happen. Every great work of literature, every great movie, not like your favorite movie when you were 18, right? But those ones that just change us as a person. You see someone making a decision in life that they're going to do something, and no matter what happens, they pay the price to see that end come. And sometimes it's in a short person named Frodo, right? <laughs> Who has hairy feet and doesn't know shoes exist yet. Who is given a task that's far too great for him to accomplish on his own, but he gets there. Not on his own, but through the power of a community seeking the same thing. You have people like Strider, right? Who's like this grizzled man of the woods. Who becomes a king as he's tested. You have Gandalf the Grey who gets a massive upgrade and a new cloak. As he goes into death and is raised back to life again. Right? These stories move us. And the book of Ruth is a story of redemption. It's a redemption of people's names. It's a redemption of places. It's a redemption of promises. And at the end of the day, and most wonderfully, it's a redemption of people. So if I'm going to say this word 85,000 times, I should probably define it. So let's throw that up. So redemption is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment. It's a, it's a clearing of dead. It's paying a price so that something might come. And whether the story's fictional, like Empire Strikes Back, ah, very fictional, ah, and the worst, ah, by far. It's not even close. I'm, I'm talking about Star Wars. Um, Right? Whether it's fictional or not, when we see redemption as people, God has hardwired it into us to be moved by it. You hear a story. Uh, at my last church, I had the pleasure of playing music with a, a, a friend of mine who had spent a few tours overseas and didn't, get come, didn't come back the same way that he left and spent seven years trapped in alcohol and drug abuse. And I got to meet him day three of his sobriety. And I talked to him a month ago, and he'd celebrated year four of sobriety and freedom. And he went from his mom being sure that he was, she was going to hear about what happened to him in a ditch one day to his mom coming back to Jesus after walking away for 30 years, playing on the worship team, then restoring their relationship. 
And it was a hard path. And redemption is always hard and it is painful and there is a huge cost to bear. But without hope of that, as people, when we hit suffering, we have no hope for our future. And here's a big idea today. I'm going to tell you right at the beginning before we even get in. You get my very last point. In order to be part of God's redemption, there is a path we must walk and there is a cost we must pay. I'm going to say that one more time. In order to be part of God's redemption, there is a path we must walk and there is a cost that we must pay. As we wrestle through this, we get to watch in live time as Boaz pays a price that is significant and generationally transformation, transforming. All right, if this is your first week here in two and a half minutes, I'm going to recap what I spent three and a half hours talking about. The book of Ruth was written about 3,000 years ago in the time of the judges. Time of the judges, good for those of you who've been here, good time, bad time. Why was it a bad time? Because everyone, great, you've been paying attention. You have to come, you're on sound. It's awesome, right? So in the time of the judges, the moral maxim of the day is that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. How many of you have children? Imagine if you had no rules in your house, what it would be like. Imagine grown-ups like that. It was that kind of dark and horrendous time. And there was a family in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem means what? House of bread. And in the house of bread, what happened? There was a famine. There was no food in the house of bread. And we find out in Judges that the reason that happened is because the people started worshiping other gods. And you might not think that's a big deal, but I'm going to explain to you in like 30 seconds why it's a really, really big deal. So they decided, Elimelech and his family decided to relocate to a, the wonderful promised land of what? Moab. Moab would be like you saying, hey, no jobs in Manistee. Let's go to where? The Islamic State of all places, because I'm sure there's a future and a hope. I heard there was food. Let's go live there right? It's that absurd of a thought. These people were mortal enemies for generations. They hated each other. And just before this in Judges, the Moabites had overtaken them, enslaved them, pillaged them, killed people. All sorts of really fun stuff, right? So they heard there was bread there, so the grass is greener. And so what happens? They went. And what do days, when we walk out of God's will, what do they always turn into people? Days turn into what? Weeks. Weeks turn into what? Months turn into what? Years and years for them ended up as a decade, I almost got that word out, as a decade in Moab. And during that time in Moab, their two sons married Moabite women. And over the course of that 10 years, both of Naomi's sons and her husband, what? They died. And she's left with nothing no present, no future. This place of Moab that promised to give her everything, what did it take? Everything, And that's what an idol does every time in our lives. Every time something promises something, it always takes everything, whether it's drug, alcohol, trying to like prove yourself to other people. The second anything becomes the first, it ruins everything. And they went to Moab and everything got lost. And Naomi's destitute in a foreign land. Oh, my God, man. I'm going to put that in my pocket because I'm going to hit this table a bunch more times, I'm sure. They're destitute in a foreign land. And Naomi says, I'm going back to the house of bread where God promises to be with his people. And she decides to leave Moab and she is so sensible. Say, Naomi's so sensible. And she's so wrong. Being sensible is not the same as being right or uh, having faith in any way, shape, or form. I'm just warning you in advance. We're about to find out about Boaz, who chooses faith over reason. Right? He's a fool in the sight of the world and full of faith in the sight of God. And she decides it's very reasonable for her daughters to stay in Moab. I just want to tell you a little bit about Moab, because it's a really terrible place. They worshiped a god named Chemosh, and in order to worship God, what did you have to do? sacrifice children or do you like physically sacrifice the life of a child in order to worship the god how vile how horrible she said it's sensible this is a place where you know daughter-in-laws right stay here yeah they may be horrific right but it's home just think about that for a minute sometimes if it's horrific and we're used to it what do we want to do we want to stay right there because it's familiar 
And they say, nope, we're coming with you. Naomi manages to convince one of her daughter-in-laws to stay. But the other one, on the midst of the road between Moab and Bethlehem, makes a confession of faith that says, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Your ways will be my ways. Where you die, I will die. And pledged her covenant loyalty to the God that Naomi worshipped, which is the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Trinitarian Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that moment... They come back together. And uh, we did this hilarious thing where I asked people how small of the town they were from, and some people made up things like less than 100. That's not even a town, right? That's like three or four big families living close in proximity, calling themselves a town. And they come back to Bethlehem, which is a small town, and the town erupts. Because when you haven't seen someone in 10 years, and there's no Facebook, Instagram, right? You don't know what's going on. After 10 years in Moab, Naomi shows up with Ruth, and there's an uproar in the town. And she comes back and says, my name is no longer Ruth. My name is what? Mara, which means bitterness. She left and her name meant beautiful and wonderful. And she came back with a new name of bitterness. But God, but she said, but the Lord has brought me back. So she gets the land of covenant promise. Ruth chooses to trust in God that the people of God will live like God has called them. And she gets there. And she goes and gleans, and she meets this man named Boaz. Is Boaz, is, is Boaz tar, tall, dark, and handsome? We have no idea. The Bible doesn't say, so you can't make it up. We have no idea. But we know one thing about Boaz. What do we know? We know two things. He's what? He is old, and he is a man of noble and worthy standing in the community. And he comes and greets his men who are work, and women who are working in the field, and he blesses them with God's love. And what do they do? They return it to him. And he meets Ruth, and they have this incredible encounter, and he sends home extra food for her, and he's just so gracious and full of blessing. That's awesome. So you, guys, you, guys, you guys aren't that excited. That's because they're with my wife. That's much more fun. Um, that's funny. Anyway, uh, totally lost train of thought. Um, anyway, so they have this great encounter. Um, she finished up the harvest season, and then Naomi and Ruth are talking. And Naomi lets Ruth know that Boaz is a redeemer. That he's someone within the covenant law of God's people that if someone was widowed and unable to take care of their land, there was a requirement for physical and financial and relational protection to be done by strong and worthy men of God that were relatives of you in the, in the land of Israel. And so in chapter 3, we see Ruth sneak quietly under the cover of darkness onto the threshing floor in the time of the judges when people did what? Whatever was right in their own eye. She snuck in where a bunch of men had just finished harvest season and had imbibed in adult beverages, um, clearly not to excess. Uh, and she went to Boaz in the middle of the night, laid at his feet like a servant and asked him to marry her. This foreign woman and at the end of the interaction, he looks at her and calls her a worthy and noble woman because she trusted in faith in God that the men of God would do the things that God had called them to do. And he says, at the end of their encounter, to wait and he will make sure that one way or another she will be redeemed, that someone would pay the price for her protection and we find ourselves here in chapter 4 where Boaz has promised to find her redeemer. So join with me. Grab your phone. Grab your Bible. We're going to be working through this. We'll be in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1. We'll start in verse 1. So here's what happened. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold... The redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. What word keeps getting said over and over in that? Sit down, sit down right? Over and over. If I say sit down, what do you think of right away? What do you think of? Okay. So I'm going to let you in. 3,000 years ago, when people heard this, when they said they sat down, the people who sat down in the group of other people were people in authority. I'm sure no one here has ever been to court before, right? So in and of, I mean, other than on a jury, right? And so sometimes 
Uh, what position does the judge take when you're in court? Are they standing? No, they're seated, right? Because in the Old Testament, anytime someone's sitting and speaking, it's saying this is a place of authority and this is really serious. And when I said he went up to the gate, what did you think about? I'm just curious. What did you think about? Okay, so in the Old Testament, the gate was an incredibly significant place. When you say you're going to the gate, it's kind of like you're going to the marketplace and the courthouse and a wise counselor all at the same time. At the gate, it, 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 they've done archaeological expeditions, I don't know, whatever they, what are they, archaeological, whatever. They dug in the ground, and they found that there were benches put in the sides right around where the gates were, where people were coming in and out. It was this big square area where commerce would happen, that if you had a dispute that the elders of the town Right? That's where juries happened. It, it was a place where significant decisions got made. So Boaz gets up, goes to the gate, and finds the man who's a closer relative who has first dibs on the redemption. And then he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So what he's doing right here, it took 10 men um, in the city, and these would be older men, uh, when there was like a trial or jury or something like that, and that's what you needed to have sufficient witnesses to a decision. He's like forcing this to happen. And he takes a sitting posture, he gathers the 10 men, and then he gets to work. It continues in verse three. And he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, but it in, well, try it, buy it in the presence of these, those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, what? I will redeem it. Okay, living in an agrarian society, what does more land mean? More money. More land means more money. In Israel, when the Israelites first came into the land, all the land was pre-allotted. There was no just like empty lots that you could go buy. All the, lo lo the land was given to specific families, right? And so the people and the land were very tied together. Has anyone here have like a family farm that's gone back for generations? Raise your hand if you have a family farm. H how tied is your family to that space? Very tied. Very tied. Four generations, right? right? We're, we're talking teens of generations they've been here at this point. In the same land, you live in the same place that your great, 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 great grandparents lived. There's no moving around, right? All the land is already given. The people and the land are one, right? They are so tied wholly to that. And so Naomi has returned and she wants to sell the land. It is interesting. Who owns the land, by the way? Naomi, just in case, just heads up, in case you were thinking. I'm just letting you know. And he asked this kinsman redeemer to buy the land. And what does a kinsman redeemer say when he gets the opportunity? Yes. And why is he so excited? Because land equals what? Money. He's, he thinks he's just won the lottery. He's like, uh, yes, I'll redeem it. <laughs> like, absolutely. Will I take care of it? And redeem it means he'll take care of Naomi until her dying day, and then his family will take over that land. That's what redeem it means. He's not like giving her a stack of bills or coins at that point. He said, I will take care of Naomi, this old woman, until her dying day, right? And then this will be absorbed into my family. And he is really excited. And then chapter five happens. Then Boaz says, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire who? Ruth, the, where is she from? The Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So I want to let you know, for those of you who are feeling uh, judgmental at this real quick, by acquire, it does not mean what you think it means. So in the Hebrew, when they say the word acquire, it means to like take under your wings. It has this, this imagery of surrounding and taking care of and being responsible for protection and provision for. To acquire someone is pretty much the exact same word as to redeem. 
this man who just hit the lottery finds out he just said yes to marrying someone from where? Moabite. Right? That's like, you're like, oh, I hit the lottery, but I have to marry someone from the Islamic State. Right? Like for most people, that would kind of slow your roll for a second. He's like, you have to marry her. And then what else does he have to do? What did it say he had to do? You have to what? Yeah, he has a mother. He has a daughter-in-law. The daughter-in-law, can the daughter-in-law have babies? Yes. yes. Can the mother-in-law have babies? Yes. No. So he was really excited when he wouldn't have to father a child. She's past that season of her life. Ruth, not past that se- try again, goodness gracious, season of her life. So the requirement would be that he would have to marry Ruth, and make, babies. make babies, exactly. And then what happens after they had a male heir? All, does he get to keep the land? No. Nope. He has to provide for two people, make more babies, take care of the land, provide for them, protect them at his own financial, all out of his own pocket. And then at the end, he gives it to who? Back to them. He thought he won the lotto. What did he do instead? He's about to go bankrupt, right? He's going to have to marry someone in a million years he would never fathom marrying because of the stigma associated to people like her. You have to father a child. He thought he hit the lottery, but instead the cost for redemption is astronomical. It's an astronomical cost that he would have to pay to be part of what God's doing in that moment. Right in verse 6. Then the Redeemer says, let's put that up. We'll read it together. This is kind of funny. Then the Redeemer said what? For myself, lest I impair my own inheritance, take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. What did he say? He said, no way. And why did he say no? The cost is too high said, that's too hard. Yeah. How sensible is that? Think about this. Like, this is an older man. This is, so this is someone in the same generation as Elimelech. So one generation up from Ruth, he's kind of set. Like, he's cruising. Like, he's got enough money. He's got his financial plan. He said he's ready to go. And now he says, sure, you can have that land, but you have to marry a young woman and start all over again. So how many of you in your 60s, don't actually answer this, want to start, want to start over at this point in your life with an infant baby? Okay, everyone, I said you don't have to answer, and all of you are answering very clearly. Yeah, I'm not listening to that answer. Someone was excited, and pretend you're not. Um, but think about it. He said, this is going to ruin me financially. This is going to take up the golden years I've worked so hard for. The cost is way too high. And I want to say, was he being sensible? Raise your hand if you think that was a sensible decision. Okay. I think it's a very sensible decision, right? If something might financially ruin me, how excited am I, am I to do it? No, I'm, like, I'm terrified to do it. Like, everyone has different hardwiring. Like, I, like, love, like, spreadsheets and financial plans. Like, I, like, remake our financial plan, like, every, like, six months because I just think it's fun, right? Like, I need better hobbies, right? But, like, everyone's got to have, like, a thing, right? So for someone like me, I hear this, and I'm like, oh, my, (laughs) right? Like, I have a plan for my finances and my life, right? Sometimes, though, in life, what happens, right? God derails our plans a little bit. Raise your hand if you're a follower of Jesus and God has ever marginally derailed plans in your life. I'm, full disclosure, I've never been to the Midwest before eight months ago. Never. I've never even heard of any town other than Detroit in Michigan a year ago. Sometimes God calls. And sometimes there's something unmistakable in our heart. And God allows us to pay a cost that we would never fathom paying without God prompting and inviting us to. So we are not going to beat up this guy, are we? He's sensible. Anyone ever been like that other than myself? I have made the sensible decisions so many times and missed out so many times on God's best. 
right? Because I wanted to not live in faith, but live in what was comfortable for me, what fit in my plans and didn't inconvenience me. Anyone been there? It's a real thing. What? I can't hear you with the mask on, sorry. Yeah, not take a risk. Right? It's, it's fascinating. Our name's important in this book. Okay. Does he have a name? No. Right. He missed out. I'm, I'm going I'm to like pull back the curtain. It's a 3,000 year old book. Guess who ends up in the genealogy of Jesus? Ruth and Boaz do. He had an opportunity to sacrifice and have Jesus be a direct portion of his lineage forever. Like, he gave that up because it would be financially and time sacrificial. Like, because he wasn't willing to sacrifice, he missed out on something great, and I don't want to beat him up for it because I don't want anyone to beat me up for it. <laughs> and I don't want anyone to beat up. I know none of you have done that before, right? But like, I don't want, God doesn't want to beat us up for that. Because God is a God of redemption in that. He has the option to put his needs of others over himself and fulfill his promise to God to take care of the least of these around him. In front of the group of gathered jury, the relative passes the buck to Boaz to redeem Ruth and Naomi. I'm going to take like a pastoral moment. We've all been that guy. We've all had opportunities to say yes to God and said no. Yes, we've all, we literally have all done that. Or you're a liar. Or you're delusional. I don't know. Any, some of the, or one of all these things. We've all done it. So what do we do in that moment where we realize we have blown it? What do we do? We ask for forgiveness. Exactly. We say like, God, I missed out. And God says, yes, you did. I am so disappointed. Do better next time. Or, you know, who knows what will happen. Let's see how your crops do this year. No. It's not, I'm telling you, that's not how it works. When we are broken and we are burdened, and when we lose it, that scripture that's now on the wall when you walked in is what Jesus said. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy. We have opportunities to do great things and be part of the great things God's done. If you've missed them, there's grace, therefore is forgiveness. Try not to miss it next time. And there will be a next time. There may not be a next time for all the things you could have done before, but there'll be a next time in the present and in the future, and I'll get off the soapbox. But I just want to encourage you as your pastor, like, if you feel like you've missed it, that is not the end of your story. And if you feel like you can't be inconvenienced, right, you're missing a core part of the gospel. Okay, I'm going to get off that. Verse 7, or I'm going to talk about that for the rest of the time. Now it was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elder and all the people, you are the witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech. And all that belonged to Kilion and Malon, also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon. I have, brought, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Naomi, at the end of chapter 3, said she was confident that because of the kind of man Boaz was, he would not rest until what? The situation, until she was redeemed. I see, you know, we worship a God that's just like that. That we worship a God that does not give up until that redemption happens. And now the matter's settled. And I think 
in our 21st century self, we look at this and be like, wow, this old man just married this young woman. Like, way to go, Boaz, right? No, I'm serious, right? There, there's a piece of us that completely misreads the scripture, right? <laughs> what is Boaz choosing to do? He's old, right? He, in the last chapter, he talks about how old he is, right? He decides to pay the price at how big of a cost, he just gave the rest of his life to her, guys. He's like an old man. He said, I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. I will raise up a child. I will invest my time, heart, resources, everything into the transformation and goodness and perpetuation generationally of the next. Not because, I mean, maybe they were in love. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's because they were in love. I, I don't think so. I think it's because Boaz knew, knew the Lord. I think it's because Boaz chose to live his life God's way. And Boaz chose God in the little things. Like, he greeted people with God's blessing. Not like, hey, idiot, right? He greeted people with God's blessing. He w took time to hear people's stories. And he chose to be faithful. And it was just one more step in his life of faithfulness to God. In order for Boaz to be part of this, there was a path he had to walk, and what else was there? It was a cost he had to bear. And he chose to walk and live his life as a servant, as a guardian, and as a protector. And I'm just gonna do a quick aside about the shoe thing. So if you wanna do more reading, I think there's a really fascinating thing here. So I'm just gonna tell you the scripture for further reading. So if you wanna read something really interesting, in Deuteronomy 25, five to 10. I'm not going to give you any more than that. But if you read that, I think there's really something incredibly fascinating on how they do the transaction. It would take me like 10 minutes to unpack. I'm not going to do it right now. But if you want to do some reading, it's really fascinating to think about the imagery for that. All that to say, it was in my notes, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, Why in the passage did Boaz marry her? Why? Active participation moment. Why did he marry her? To redeem her. To redeem her. Why else? It says it in the book. There's not, it's not a trick question. To be obedient to the Lord, right? Because that was clearly God's call and God's intent. We read, we read about that a few times. Great. Why else? To maintain the generational name of his relative. Did he do it because he was in love with Ruth? It's not in the book. I might want to think it's true, right? Hallmark definitely thinks it's true, right? If you watch those trash movies. Anyway, all that, right? But, but it's not what that is. He just loves Jesus. He loves God so much. I know Jesus wasn't incarnate yet, blah, 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 right? But like, he loves the Lord so much that he's willing to give up everything. His, fret, his comfort, his pleasure, to honor and to serve and to bless another. Boaz purchases the land for the express purpose and benefit of someone else. He got, no he got nothing out of this. Like, dude's just like ready to retire and hang it up. And now he's got a, like, how many of you, when was the last time you guys spent time with a toddler? Just think about that. Or teething time. Teething, you guys are teething right now, right? How fun is that? It's, it's so fun, right? There's no drool, right? And they definitely never chew on you, right? In uncomfortable places. Like my nephew, when he, was chew, when he was teething, would look at you and like bite your toes if you weren't paying attention, right? Because he just wanted to chew on stuff all the time, right? Boaz is saying yes to an incredible life of inconvenience for the sake of his faithfulness and commitment to God. What an example. Like what an incredible encouragement. I was, I was reading this this week and I'm like, what a blessing it is to serve. I, I, the people go and, we, I mean, we have like 25 or 30 different adults who serve over in the kids' ministry over the course of like the six-week rotation back there. And like, it's a joy. Like I watch people come out, they're like, I'm tired. <laughs> that was crazy, but that was so good. It's like when someone needs a meal because <laughs> something bad happens. Like I, I set up the meal train when Sam was in the hospital. And I can, so by the way, like, Full disclosure, I can see how many people like click on things when I send out emails. I don't know who, but I can see how many. We had like 45 people click on the meal train to see if they can go from the church so they could provide a meal. 
for a family when they needed it in the church. Like, there's something good about doing this. So I want to finish off, and we're going to look at three ways that Boaz calls us and reminds us to live a life of faithfulness. And we'll finish this quickly. So first big thing, it is a choice. Say, it's a choice. Say, it's a choice. Come on, wake up. It's a choice. If the person next to you is asleep, elbow them, right? right? It's a choice to participate in Jesus' redemptive plan in your life, right? God does not force himself on you. You have a choice whether you're going to follow Jesus with your whole life and with your whole heart. Like, you get to make that choice, right? And there's consequences for good and for not when we do. So I just want to encourage you, like, the life of faith does not happen on accident. It, it just doesn't happen on accident ever, right? It happens wholly on purpose, right? God is clear in the call for us. It is core to redemption that we walk the path that Jesus beckons us to walk. And we have to make the decision before the moment happens whether when God gives us an opportunity whether we're going to say yes or no. I want you to know if you haven't made that decision beforehand, what decision will you make? No. The answer will be no. Unless you've already made the decision to say yes to Jesus when Jesus invites you to do something, the chances of you saying yes in that moment while your flesh is like, oh, personal sacrifice. Oh, no, that's going to be hard. Right? We have to choose beforehand to live that life of faith, honoring God. Second, choosing to be part of Jesus' redemption of the world causing an incredible transformation in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Right? We worship God and live in his ways, not just for our own edification, but for what purpose? Right? To go make disciples of what? Of all nations, right? In case you didn't know why we exist, right? To be Christ's witnesses to the world and to be his physical and tangible hands and feet until Jesus returns and makes all things good again. Like Boaz chose to be part of God's redeeming purpose in the world and it costs a lot. But to be able to see that in his legacy, and we're going to talk about it next week, his legacy, he got to be part of God's very self coming into this world to save sinners like you and like me. He got to have a piece of that because of this selfless decision 3,000 years ago. And finally, in this life of faith, there's always a cost to play. Try that again. In this life of faith, there's always a cost to, to pay. Like Boaz and Ruth, and all the characters in the great stories we read, there's always a cost to pay. Right? For Frodo, what was the cost at the end of the book? <laughs> Come on. No, I'm serious. Who's, who's, okay. I'm going to let you know. The gray havens that he goes to at the end is death. Yeah. Guess what it cost him? It cost him his very life. Someone like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who saw the great evil of Nazi Germany, what did it cost him? It cost his life. People like Corey Tenenboom. It cost her choosing to forgive. Like a Nazi guard who had abused her and her family when she saw him in church 40 years later. The call of the gospel, it costs a lot. It costs our right to be angry and not forgive. It costs our ability to decide how our life will turn out. It costs our ability to choose how we spend our time and our money and who we spend time with. Um, I spend enough time with people in this room, not all of you would hang out without Jesus, right? We could never be one without God forgiving us and filling us with his grace. There's always a cost to pay. And in Luke 14, Jesus is this, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciples. Like, as followers of Jesus, it's all the Lord's. It's all our time, our demanding it's our favorite way. It's our preferences we give up. Like as a missionary, I ate some gross things, right? But there are things you give up, like your preferences and your tastes and things that are familiar to you because there is something greater to be had when we pay the cost, when we take up our cross daily, lay our lives down, and follow him.
As the worship team comes up, I'm going to pray for us. Um, And it's a simple finish today. To follow Jesus, there's a cost. And the cost is all of you, and that's the greatest part of the good news. Um, So I'm just going to take a moment to to pray for us. And I want to encourage you, uh, if you are here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I I want you to know that the redemption and the grace and the forgiveness that's talked about uh, is offered to you today. Um, And if you are taking a step of faith in some way today, we have a connection card and on the back there's a space to check a box and we'll hang out and I'll hear your story and hear what God's doing. I'd love to follow up and be a part of that. And for those of you who love Jesus, I have great news for you. Your life is not your own. You were bought at a price and you get to be part of other people's transformation. By all those kids in that room, someone gets to be the person here who shares the gospel with them for the first time. That there are guests who come in who you get to be the first one that God welcomes when they show up. There are neighbors that you get to be the first person that has talked to them in a year. You get to be the family member who chooses forgiveness when you have the right to not. You get to be the person who feeds the hungry person. You're the person who sees the exploited person and fights for their justice. You get to be the person who says, Lord, my life is not my own. I'll follow you where you lead. And we live in a legacy for 2,000 years of brothers and sisters who have said yes to Jesus and the cost was high. Some of it their life, some was their families. Many of them, it was their jobs and their livelihood and their hope in this present world. But no, as people of God, God has called us to this incredible high calling that if we give our life up, what do we do? We find it and we find it in abundance in a way that we can't fathom when we're holding on tight. Church, we're gonna follow Jesus wherever he leads. And that always leads to us laying down our life and taking up our cross and following him. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful for our brother Boaz who points us to Jesus and his forgiveness and his redemption. Lord, we're thankful that you have paid a price for us that we might be agents of your blessing and your gospel and your good news in our lives. Lord, we pray that as followers of you, that we would bear that good news to the people that we meet, that we would not see our life and make decisions based on what makes us feel good, but what you are calling and asking us to do regardless of the sacrifice. Lord, we lay ourselves down. Come and be with us. Jesus, I want to pray right now for people who are here who haven't yet made that commitment to follow you, Lord, that they would know that there is a God of grace and mercy who beckons them to come. Lord, I pray that you are stirring in any hearts, Lord, that uh, that they would take a risk as we sing this next song to ask you to come and dwell with them and to be their redemption. Lord, we want to honor you with our lives. We pray that you would come and be with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.